Hello, welcome back. Um, my name is Daniel Gormali. Welcome back to YouTube, uh, which is called Hometown Chess Hero. Today we're going to be talking about candidate moves and we're going to be discussing um, some old games that I've played in the past. So the first game we're going to look at is a game that I played against Mark Hebden, who's like a legend of English chess. And Mark has played professional chess for over 30 years. I mean, I first played him in 1996, but I think he his professional career dates back to the 1970s. So he was playing in British Championships for a long, long time. I played him a lot around about the 1990s, early 2000s. I had a good score against Mark, actually. Uh, but in recent years, that started to decline. Um, maybe partly variance, you know, um, but also maybe uh, an indication I'm less self-confident than I was than I was when I was younger. Anyway, this game was played in the Millfield uh, British Championships in 2000. And uh, I had black pieces. And it was a funny story. There's a few funny stories behind this uh, this tournament. So, um, so summer, go back to summer 2000. So just turned them into the new millennium. I uh, didn't have any money. Still being a professional chess bum, right? As, as I do now. And uh, I realised the British Championships was coming up. I didn't have any money to play in it because the accommodation was something like three, four hundred pounds. I was an IM at the time, I believe, so it wasn't getting any conditions to play. I didn't get any conditions for the British for quite a few years, actually. Um, most of the years that I played in those years, I didn't get any conditions. So what I did is I went down to Coombs um, betting shop in um, Lee High Road. So it's in the junction between. Um, a road up to Blackheath, what road is that? It's called Burnt Ash Road. And I lived there. I only lived there for about most of my life. And um, there were two Coombs betting shops on that road. And that was the one at the end of the road on that junction. Uh, sort of like Sainsbury's nearby. A Weatherspoon's pub or eventually became a Weatherspoon's pub. The kind of area's gone downhill a little bit. And if you go further out, you get down to Sidcup. Anyway, I went down there and I about... I don't know, 30 or 40 quid on me and I was like betting it and it was one of those days which is like probably happens like three or four times a year if you're a punter where everything you bet ends up winning Some, someone was looking down at me so I ended up winning like about 300 quid if I'd done an accumulator on all those horses I think pretty much everything I bet won I probably would have won about several thousand pounds but anyway I was quite happy because I suddenly had 300 quid so I went down to Millfield you know, because I was like really felt, felt I was missing out before then. Uh, you know, my friends, people like Simon Williams were playing. I wasn't there. So I went down and uh, stayed in, we were playing in Millfield School, which is a private school in Somerset. And we are staying on accommodation. And I remember I met like a, there was like a father there with his son and the son was playing in the tournament or one of the tournaments. Uh, I ended up playing golf with them. I was chatting, chatting to them a little bit, like a little bit of um, putting or something like that. And, you know, there were lots of stuff to do there, like uh, sporting games and stuff. You could play ping pong. You do all sorts of stuff there. And I had a little bit of an issue early on because I had some kind of um, something in my buttock shall we say, it was like ingrowing hair. So I had to have that, eventually I had that removed, but during the whole of the tournament, this became a problem for me because this became a problem for me because um, it was causing me immense pain. I didn't really know, really know what was causing the pain. I had this soreness around my you know, backside and I couldn't sit down properly. So I was getting funny looks. So I was standing up like I was doing a post-mortem. But I think when I played Mark, it wasn't the issue wasn't as big then. It just became worse as the tournament went on. I think I played Mark fairly early on. I'm going to show you the game, actually. It was an interesting uh, game. And uh, he went D4, right? As he normally does. And he played his favourite Barry attack. So the Barry attack. I'm not sure why it's called the Barry attack. I think it's because it's a load of old Barry. That was the, that was the theory. It was a load of old Barry. And um, interesting idea. So obviously one move that Black could play is simply to go d6. And 
and um, of course then white would likely go e4 or take the center but the drawback of knight c3 potentially is this move d5 that's what I played in the game but mark I knew even at the time we didn't have um, chess base or anything like that so much then or it wasn't as big a thing as it is, it is now we, we still would prepare with computers to some extent but I knew anyway that Mark um, played a lot of games in the Barry, had a, had a lot of games, and um, I knew that he was he was uh, somebody who was an expert on this particular variation, probably the main expert in this particular variation. And I played c5. I mean, Black can play other moves here, but this is the most typical way. If Black would not be concerned about losing the pawn here because you just regain the pawn. You're going to take on c5. If white castles, you're going to regain the pawn and you'll have some kind of control over the center. So Mark played the move knight e5, which is what he normally did in this position. I played knight c6. I'd already had maybe one or two games with him in this variation before this game. He castled. I played bishop f5, I think. From memory, in, in, in a subsequent game, I, I played Queen b6 against Mark. Or maybe I took, actually, I think I took and went Queen b6. But Bishop f5 is a reasonable move. Again, you're probably not fearing d takes e5 because you can normally regain the pawn fairly easily. Or it's not really a critical try. I am wondering actually why that isn't a move. It probably Mark has played this before. Because he's played many variations in the Barry, many games. Because Queen A5, I'm thinking, is Knight D5, right? So I'm wondering even if you can take. But he didn't play that. He went Knight A4, which is a natural move. I took, I took back, and he took. Went Knight D7. So it looks like what White's done is slightly strange. Put the Knight on A4. He's not really. Contested the center with this move c4, but actually is very typical way that Mark would like to play for a slight advantage. And knight on a4 is well placed because it's stopping the, the uh, break c5. So I played a move knight d7 with the idea of playing e5, very natural move. But the problem is you get e in e5, but then what? This is a problem that Black faces in this variation in this particular position, and this is partly why maybe Mark was so comfortable playing the Barry because uh, you could play it for a slight advantage, a slight nibble and there wasn't much danger of, of, of losing, you know, there's not much danger of anything going wrong here for, for White. So White played rookie one, another natural move would be, say for example, to play the move, uh, hang on a minute, what happened there? Sorry, uh, you could have played the move C3 very natural move, clamp, you know, clamping down. But then e5 would happen. You drop the bishop back, probably to e3. Uh, rookie one e5. You could have also gone bishop e3, but I don't think that would have changed a great deal. He took. I took with a knight, and uh, he played queen d2. Rookie eight was played. Why well, went rook d1? Queen h4, probably like a typical me move, right? Just like a nothing move, but, you know, it's like, I think the weakness I had, we'll see this actually in the game, uh, was that, I mean, I didn't really train on chess. Um, you know, I spent more time down the bookies. You know, my approach down the bookies was probably similar to my approach at, at chess. It was very intuitive. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time studying the form. I just right. I like the name of that. I like like the name of that horse. Um, or I had a dream about that last night. You know, or that looks good. That looks like a nice name. You know, it's, it's all sorts of silly stuff. Um, and it's probably like Queen H four. That looks like a nice move. I didn't really train like a proper professional would in the sense of really working on your middle games, really working out how to, how, how do I get rid of that? Hang on, hang on a minute. Uh, B3. 
Yeah, so B3, very solid move by Mark, you know, so he's effectively defending that knight, so there's no danger of me somehow coming across with a queen. Uh, queen f6, you know, again, a sign that I don't really know what I'm doing, right? I mean, I've gone, I haven't found a plan. This is my weakness in chess. I couldn't find plans. Uh, still can't. I'm quite lazy. I'm superficial. My strength is I'm intuitive. I'm creative. I'm probably quite a creative person. I've got a good brain. I'm quite sharp. I'm quite good at blitz. But, you know, when it came to forming plans, finding unusual candidate moves, I wasn't that great. Oh, and h3. Should g5, queen d6, bishop f4. Yeah, and this is a crucial moment here. I think. And this is where Mark missed a good chance to be a lot better. He didn't take it, interestingly enough. And uh, so, because what I did, I checked this game with a computer. To be honest, I probably should have just checked it by myself and try to work out all the better moves. That's the diligent way to do it. That's the proper way to do it. Work out what White could have played instead. Um, but instead, uh, I just checked it with the engine, right? And the engine came up with an interesting move here for White. Uh, that is uh, not a move that even occurred to me, I think, during the game. I don't think it really occurred to Mark either, to be totally honest. It's not an obvious move at all. So you might even want to freeze your computer here to work out what White should have played. It's a very, very tough puzzle. I think. Uh, so, you know, congratulations if you find the move without an engine. It's not obvious to me at all. Not obvious at all. So it's like here, you, you're here, you White, you've basically developed all your pieces. So you put the Rook on D1, the Rook on E1, the Bishop on E2, Queen on D2, Bishop on F4. So you effectively got to the middle game Nine A four. All your pieces stand well. Um, so the old Russian advice, of course, was when you uh, when all your pieces stand well, what you should do is play play a pawn move. But I don't think it is a pawn move here. Obviously, that is like a generalization, right? It all depends on the position. Uh, but that was good advice, actually, because that's often a way you can use process of elimination to say look I've placed all my pieces look at the white position all the pieces are on good squares you know he's played it very very well Mark's a very good good player he's a very you know top probably should have achieved more than he did I think his highest ever rating was about 2595 probably should have won a British championships but he achieved a lot in chess anyway he's won a lot of tournaments um, he won Isle of Man, he's, he's won Capel, I think, he's won like, tournaments in India, he's, he's won all over the place, he's won many, many tournaments in, in the UK, he's been one of the best players in the UK for many, many years. Uh, but White, to play in his position, could have played, yeah, this is a star move, Bishop D3, wow, not even a move, it looks kind of counterintuitive, you're placing the bishop on a square. Where it's hit by knight, but of course we know the knight can't take because the queen will take. So yeah, when I check this, the move played in the game, I believe, was c4, which actually looks very natural, right? That's what I was saying, you know, when, when all your pieces stand well, you play a pawn move. So that actually looks like probably a more natural move, right? I think in a blitz game, we'd all go c4. But the computer says that c4 is not the best move. It says that bishop d3 is the best move. So, this is where it gets difficult to explain why bishop d3 is the best move. Um, I think that one of the, re one of the reasons I show you actually is that, um, after bishop d3, bishop d7, black, white goes, uh, b4. Now b4 is an excellent move in this type of position because you're clamping down on this c5 square. You're not winning the game. You're not winning the game, but you're clearly better. Because you're clamping down on the c5 square. And the structure is very nice. And Mark um, knew these structures. He probably would have outplayed me from here. It's a very unpleasant position for black. However, if you play the move b4 immediately, which, again, looks slightly counterintuitive as well in some ways because you, you're kind of lo losing control over this c4 square, whereas c4 is another natural break for white. 
Black has an amazing response here. I think you go G5. Yeah, this is what the computer is saying. Again, it comes out with resources that a lot of us struggle to find. G5. Keith Arkell was a great, was a great rival, long, long time rival of, uh, Mark. And uh, both from the same era and both very strong players. He loves to move G5. I'm not sure why, but in this particular position, it, it actually makes a lot of tactical sense because the point is if you take on g5 i play a move like queen g6 and now i'm threatening to take on c2 i'm threatening moves like h6 and bishop takes h3 threatening ideas like that so it makes tactical sense if you take on e5 well yeah your king size is a little bit weak for black but i guess you can just take out the rook and you should be doing quite well possibly bishop takes is also playable uh, very hard to see all this, you know, again, computer variations. But I think bishop d3 is a move you could get to. Once you know, know that b4, g5 is dangerous. Now if I do this, g5 actually is not so tempting because you take and there's no queen g6. And if you take here, I just take. Uh, actually, no, I take, sorry, I don't take about the queen because b4 is hanging, but I take about the pawn. And now here... It's, it's slightly different now. I can play a move the king like king h1. And you actually don't have any ideas, any clever ideas. Very, very tough middle game puzzle. That's all I would describe this as. An extremely tough. It'd be interesting if you show this position to a 2700. You know, like to a Magnus. Or like even stronger than a 2700. Like to a Magnus. And you said white to play. Would he find bishop d3? I'm not sure he'd find it. I, I, honestly, I would. I would not be sure. It'd be very tough for anybody to find bishop d3. c4 does look more natural. It's not the best move. I went d4. Well, a very obvious tactical point that you can't really take here because there's a knight f3 in the air. So the game kind of petered out after that. He now played bishop d3, so like a move late. So he'd actually seen this idea, bishop d3, but he kind of played it like a move late. So... It's quite possible he could have found that move bishop d3 earlier. So tactical reason, knight d3, rook e8, rook e8, bishop d6. Um, white is clearly better. They're going back to this position. I did actually take, but then I went queen a3. Which again, like very gorm like very tactical. Like I'm, I'm like, I was like a weak version of Fritz. Now I'm like a... I'm like a weak version of, um, I don't know, Pokemon or something. <laughs> I'm just like a weak version of something anyway. But Queen a3, uh, attacking the pawn on a2, also attacking the queen. So you see I've gone Queen h4, Queen a3, like in the same game, right? And Rook e7, Queen f3, Rook went to e8, again, tact tactics, Queen c6, Bishop h2. Yeah, nice use of tactics. Game kind of petered out here, actually. And, uh, yeah, I did a reasonable job of defending. So he had that slight chance. He didn't take it. And I held, like, a strong opponent with black, which was which was a key game for me. So, uh, funnily enough, uh, after this tournament, so I think the, uh, you know, the tournament ended. And I did reasonably well. I think it was one of those ones where I won a prize. I got seven and a half or something. You normally needed to get seven and a half to win a prize at the British. It's either seven or seven and a half. I might have got seven. I can't really re remember. I won like 600 or 700 quid. I was very happy with that. Beat Colin Crouch. Very nice attack in the final round. Colin was a client of mine. You know, when you feel like client. It was somebody I had a good score against. Colin sadly died a few years ago. I'm going to start crying. All this reminiscing. All this sentimentality. Um... And, uh, yeah, so that was a game against Mark. But, yeah, so what happened was uh, I then went on from there and I played in the, um, there was a mind sport, it was a Ron Banwell Memorial Tournament in London. So I used the money from that, the motivation from that, the, the impetus from that to go and play in this tournament. And funny enough, I played Mark in the penultimate round, round eight. And I was on six out of seven. I was already doing well. I started with five out of five. Amazing start. I was on five out of five. I was flying. I beat Chennai to get five out of five. 
and that same night we were outside Alexander Palace. So the first two rounds, funny enough, were played in a different venue. I remember turning up to the venue, and I was walking around, I was seeing all these people like Mark and, and June Hodgson and Keith and Plaskett and all these kind of people, and I was looking at them, I was thinking, nobody's really up for this. You know, nobody really really wants this. You know, worst, like it's after Lord Mayor's ch show. We've had the British, nobody really cares. I've just got that sense. Whereas I was like, yeah, this is like my British, really, because this is a chance for me to get a norm. So I'd really, really struggled to get norms up to that point, And I kept missing by half a point. But I remember that when we were outside Alexander Palace and I was chatting outside on the bench, I was with Tony Stebbins, I was chatting to him, and I saw this comet, or this, sorry, sorry shooting star, not comet, obviously, shooting star, or remnant of a meteorite or comet, shooting across the sky as we were chatting. And I thought, hang on, that's an omen. I'm on five out of five, I'm flying along, this is an omen, this is my week. So I beat Mark in a barrier attack, um, which was a good game, actually. In round eight, and I got to uh, so at that point I was on seven out of eight. I then played Aaron Summerscale with White in the final round. I drew with Aaron. I only needed a draw to win the tournament. I'd already got the GM norm by that point, so I beat Mark to get my first GM norm. That was great. But obviously after that, you know, years after that, my my score against Mark started to decline a little bit. But there was one other game I wanted to show you in this tournament. Um, so I think this I'm just going to turn this YouTube channel into reminiscing about my old chess adventures um, so we get out of that and then we go into this and this game I was I was white actually against Murray Chan that might have been around about the same period of the tournament quite early on I might have been even been the previous round against uh, before I played Mark and Murray Chan again, very very well known GM. Played for England on several occasions. He, he came from New Zealand. He came all the way over from New Zealand uh, to England because there was no not enough chess tournaments in 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 New Zealand for an ambitious young chess player. Uh, Murray Chan was a real had a real hard work ethic. Uh, he would study many hours on chess. As I explained the other day in another video, um, if you come all the way from New Zealand uh, to live in the UK to play chess, you don't want to bum around all day. You want to do something quickly. And that's what he did. And he became a pretty strong GM. I think he may have even got over 2,600 at some point. One of the strongest players in the, in the UK. But by the time I played him, he was more or less a retired player. And uh, he... Um, he was more focusing on publishing. He had a publishing company, which still does, which he's still involved with. And uh, so effectively, he was sort of like retired, semi-retired from playing tournaments to become a businessman. And I was white, and Murray Sean had played the can variation, or this, yeah, this kind of can time and of kind of structure. We were talking about this yesterday in this Ferrugia game. This, this structure for black is very, very solid. Born F7, E6, D7. It's very, very hard for white to do anything here. You have to be very patient as white to create anything. And this is my weakness in chess, is that I wasn't very patient. You know, we talked about this. I'm a very intuitive person. And I didn't understand plans. Still don't. So knight f6, uh, f4 is very natural. Yeah, d6, queen e2, g6. So what move would you play here and why? So this is like a key moment in the game. And I think I was already at my fear. I was like, what, what else g6? You know, what's that move? Obviously, like... You know, 2600 player around about that time, even 2000, we're talking about dinosaur era, really, for chess now, as, as it's played now. Uh, but people were still very strongly used databases. You know, they would have known that this was theory, but I didn't. Um, so I was kind of already on my, uh, on my own at this point. I didn't come up with the best plan for why. So what would you play here as why? So just move the camera in a little bit didn't play the best move at all <coughs> what I played here so again freeze position think about the position you may already know that this is theory you may already know what white should play 
Um, no, I went knight b3. Actually, that was already not a great move. So it's funny, actually, I played the British Championships in 1999 in Scarborough, and I actually played against John Ems. I played in a more accurate way, really, in that game. Not the same, exactly the same position, but similar opening. And I played an early e5, and this is what I should have done here as well. So e5, uh, black goes knight d7. So I think if black takes, then it's very clear that your bishop is coming to f4 and you got very good play. So something like this might happen. Let's say you went bishop c bishop b4. I could even castle. Could I castle maybe? Because if you go here, can I actually say?